What's good, y'all? It's your boy Ross back at again with another video. So we're gonna check out Bad Mike Skills Wrestling's Worst Talkers by Wrestling uh, Wrestle with Andy. If you haven't subscribed to his channel, go ahead and subscribe to him. Link to the original video will be down below. See, as a wrestler, one or two things are gonna happen. Either or it's a it can be a combination. Either you'll be fantastic delivering promos and on the microphone your in-ring ability may not be up to par but it's serviceable you can sell someone on a match or it can be a situation where your microphone skills are to be desired but your in-ring ability is superb so a lot of times your opponent has to sell the match and you can just you know put in the fantastic work rate within the ring or the rare time where your microphone abilities are fantastic and your in-ring work is fantastic. And I forgot there's a fourth option. If your microphone skills is awful and your in-ring skills is awful, then you're one of those uh, rare individuals where both of them suck. So <laughs> we're gonna check out some of the individuals where their uh, microphone skills were not up to par to everyone else at the time. Appreciate all the love and support. You guys are showing on the channel, man. Should be a good one. Let's do this. One of the most important skills in a wrestler's arsenal is the ability to cut a good promo. Right. Hell, it's this very skill which has helped to see the likes of Rowdy Roddy Piper, Macho Man Randy Savage, mm -hmm. and The Rock rise to the top over the years. That said, not everyone can be as good on the mic as those performers. Mm -hmm. No, some fall on the opposite end of the spectrum, in fact. But who are the biggest offenders when it comes oh, to bad verbal skills? I don't know! I don't know! Well, that's exactly what we're going to be looking at today. Ron and is if definitely we're going to start list. anywhere, let's do so with one of the biggest examples of someone who should never be let anywhere near a microphone, and that's Ahmed Johnson. Yes, over the course of his three-year run with WWF between 1995 and 1997, the Pearl River powerhouse quickly developed a reputation as being someone who may have had the physical look required to be a star, but who certainly didn't have the voice. Mm. And this was because every time he was given the opportunity to cut a promo, he did so in just about the most incomprehensible way imaginable. Seriously, go back and listen to any of Ahmed's interview segments and try to figure out what he's saying. What? But even if his words could be parsed, it likely wouldn't have met much anyway, as the former Intercontinental Champion wasn't exactly Shakespeare at the best of times. I don't take my Prozac anymore. And when I get off Prozac, brother, you don't know what might happen. And this what? didn't exactly help him endear himself to his bosses in the long run, because as we all know, Vince McMahon's idea of sports entertainment requires someone be an all-rounder who can do more than just wrestle in the ring. Mm -hmm. In fact, being a good wrestler is way down there on the list of things he needs someone to be in order. And like I said, there's been plenty, we've seen plenty of individuals that were fantastic at wrestling, but their microphone skills were to be desired. One noticeable individual was Cesaro when he was in WWE. His microphone skills were definitely 2P desired. He was not good at selling you a match. But his in-ring ability is top-notch. One of the best wrestlers WWE had in the company at the time he was with WWE. So that should let you know. And Vince, even though he, you know, appreciate his physique and his wrestling ability, the reason why he never got that real big push is because he couldn't really talk. He wasn't that good at selling you on a match and building off a promo. So. Order to turn them into a star. But then it's not as if Ahmed Johnson was great in ring either. Yeah. No, with a reputation for hurting his co-workers, he couldn't exactly rely on this to give him any traction. So when you combine that with the fact that he couldn't cut a good promo either, it yeah. was only a matter of time till his run in New York came to an end. Mm -hmm. Of course, he wasn't the only one working for WWF during the tail end of the new generation era who had a habit of cutting promos so out there, few could figure out what the hell he was trying to say. And that's because elsewhere on the card at this point, Sid was also <laughs> applying his craft. That's right, he may have half the brain you do, but Sid UD never let this hold him back. Because at times, in 1996 and 1997, he'd somehow managed to transform himself into one of the most over baby faces Vince McMahon had on his roster. Mm -hmm. How had he done this? Well, through sheer force of charisma. That and a physique which looked like it was ripped straight out of the golden era. 
That said, he needed both these things in high volumes because one skill he certainly didn't have in his arsenal was the ability to cut a promo. BECAUSE YOU ARE FEARED OF ME! Sure, there is an ironic quality to his rambling, incoherent speeches, which has allowed people to go back and enjoy them now. Yeah. But back then, it wasn't as if these were doing much to increase his stock. No, with his constant botching of words and phrases, they only served to make him look like a fool, something which only became more apparent when he went to WCW and was there, given even more leeway to come across as stupid. Yeah. You're only half the man that I am! And I have half the brain that you do! Really, the only thing you can do... I have half the brain that you do. What? What? Why would you say that about yourself? Who is laugh, otherwise it would be too tragic to watch. And that's not something any performer wants you to be saying about their work. But then sometimes promos like this can go to a level even greater, where they're actually so bad they're good, mm -hmm. and as a result, help to get someone over in a whole new way, as was the case Scott with Steiner, Scott yeah. Steiner. Now we're sure you're all aware of that promo. You know the one. Yeah. It's the segment from an episode of Impact in 2008 where Big Papa Pump attempted to explain <laughs> the math behind why he was going to dominate both Samoa Joe and Kurt legendary. Angle at the upcoming Sacrifice <laughs> pay-per-view. Legendary. And while bro. this created a moment so legendary, it's since become a full-blown meme and the thing the former WCW <laughs> World Champion is most known for amongst younger fans today. Mm -hmm. The fact remains, it's only scratching the surface of the wild promos he's provided us over the why? years. <laughs> yes, they say all men are created equal, but when you look at Scott Steiner, whenever he has a mic in his hand, you can see that statement is not true. Nope. You see, normally whenever a main event star gets time to talk, you've got a 50-50 chance of it being good. <laughs> but then he's a genetic freak and not normal, so that means there's a 25% chance at best <laughs> like it's going to work out. There. <laughs> And then there was the time he went off script and told WCW fans to change the channel and watch Steve Austin on Raw instead. Mm. Or the time his first audible words during his return to WWE in 2002 were him screaming, Give me the f mic to some poor unseen figure. Yeah. Honestly, we could sit here all day <laughs> listing times Scott Steiner went buck wild during an interview oh and made God. unintentional magic in the process. Hel Here's the thing with him. His promos were obviously not the best in a sense of creating some type of storyline or whatever the case may have been but they were like the bad good like they were bad in a sense because he's just saying whatever the hell he wants and it may not even make a lick of sense but it's good because people will remember them they're they're not promos that you just you don't remember you know what I'm saying? You associate certain promos with him because they're so legendarily wild. So he's one of those people that delivered promos that were so wild that they were unforgettable and it worked out. <laughs> well, he could probably fill about half a dozen videos himself with all the material he's given us over the years. But in the interest of making sure we give enough space to others, we'll move on for now and instead look at someone who was just as rambling and drug-fueled at their yeah. peak, and that's the Ultimate Warrior. Rest in peace. Again, we likely don't need to explain to any of you how crazy Jim Helwig's promo style was. That's not to say that he wasn't a big star back in his day, yeah. though. No, he was one of the biggest ever, in fact. After all, who can say they briefly dethroned Hulk Hogan as the top babyface of WWF during the Golden Era? Mm -hmm. Just the Warrior and Randy Savage, yep. and that's it. That's it. But while the Macho Man was an all-time great on the stick, his Indiana-born counterpart sadly <laughs> couldn't say the same. Because whenever he was called upon to carry an interview segment, his method of doing so usually involved ranting in such an indecipherable way, you would have needed a translator if you wanted to understand him. And it was this way of doing things which gave us such gems as his WrestleMania 6 pre-match promo on Hulk Hogan, the one where he threatened to crash a plane into the ocean. Now, quite how this was supposed to help him win the match remains unclear. Just as it remains unclear what he was trying to say during his never-ending speech when he showed up on Nitro in 1998 and there challenged the Hulkster to the rematch of the century. But one thing we can be sure of is that it made sense to him, even if it didn't to anyone else. No, when you're dealing with Jim Helwig, you have to accept the fact that there's not going to be a lot of logic to the proceedings. And if you can do that, then there's at least a camp quality which can be taken from the thing. One person who it's very hard to see the fun in, though, when it comes to his abilities on the mic is our next subject, and that's because while he might have been a lethal weapon once the bell rang, yeah. when asked to speak, Steve Blackman had all the charisma of a plank of wood. Facts. Hell, you could argue even a plank of wood.
Yeah, he he definitely had the the in ring ability to murder you, but outside of that, you ask him to build up a match, sell a match, sell his own match to the fans. You can you can hang that up. <laughs> Wood had more character as Hacksaw Jim Duggan was able to get one of those over in a big way. Yeah. But when it came to the Pennsylvania native, there would be no such similarities. As with his monotone voice and lack of anything interesting to say, every interview segment he had felt as painful as dental surgery. Sure, you could argue he never needed to cut promos as his strengths were always in his legitimate martial arts skills. Yeah. Skills which made him a fairly big deal on the Attitude Era WWF mid-card. But then, the fact that he had the likes of Ken Shamrock and Dan the Beast Severn to work with here, two people who complemented his style perfectly, certainly helped to make things easier for him in that area. The same could not be said for when he was asked to go up against performers such as Owen Hart or Shane McMahon, however, as with them being excellent mic workers, yeah. it meant Blackman was forced to try and go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. And when he did, such incidents only exposed his staggering lack of charisma all the more. This way, this thing's got to end one way or another. He tried to force that. He definitely tried to force that, man. <laughs> this this thing got to end one way or another. What, nigga? You know, just shut up and go beat him up, man. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Sometimes we're not entirely convinced the man wasn't just a very advanced robot who'd been programmed with all the skills of a dozen different Bruce Lee movies. <laughs> that said, for as bad as he was, he did always have those in-ring skills to fall back on, and this at least meant the six-time hardcore champion was able to make a nice career for himself, even if he couldn't talk worth a damn. Bats. It's just a shame the same couldn't be said for oh, our next subject then, because brother. despite him oh. also having a legitimate history in shoot fighting, not only was Jake Hager unable to translate this into a wrestling ring, but he also wasn't able to cut a promo either. Facts. And this has been something which has followed the Fargo native all the way back since his days in WWE, where he wrestled under the name of Jack, Jack Swagger. Swagger. Yep. Hell, so bad was he there that even when he briefly won the World Heavyweight title in 2010, you could have easily forgotten he was on screen at all at the best of time. Facts. Yeah, yeah bro. It's, it, it, jeez. <laughs> it's just oh man just a charisma vacuum <laughs> why was this well whenever he was given a microphone he instantly sucked all the energy out of the room with his anti-charisma there we go Even once his time with wwe came to a close he continued to work in the industry by signing on the dotted line with all elite wrestling where he currently serves as an enforcer to the trio of Daniel Garcia, Cool Hand Angelo Parker, and everyone's favorite hard-nippled man, the Canadian national treasure that is <laughs> Daddy Magic, Matt Menard. And yes, you could argue that he's gotten one thing over during his time there with his I like this hat gimmick. I like this but hat. But compared to other recent great AEW bits like Tony Storm morphing into a fallen Hollywood starlet, mm -hmm. this is pretty small potatoes. Still, it could be worse because moving back to WWE for a moment, we find our next subject. Someone who doesn't even have a hat to help get her over. Yeah. And here's the thing. <clears throat> what they did do to try to help him, and it kind of did get him over in a sense, was pairing him with Zeb Coulter and they're doing We The People stuff. That actually kind of got him over. It did. He didn't need to talk. He's one of those guys, you don't have him talk because you're going to get you're going to send the people that paid money to watch. You're going to send them home. They're going to want to leave. So pairing him with Zeb Coulter at the time worked. He needs to be paired with other people. Him by himself? New. No, 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 no. No, all she has is a complete and utter lack of promo skills, and that's Tamina Snuka. Oh, man. Now, you could argue that it's unfair to include Tamina in this video, as she rarely, if ever, cuts promos. Yeah. But to that, we'd say there's a reason she doesn't, and this reason is because she's so bad at them. <laughs> and if you don't shut up, I'm going to make you look like Ellsworth. A few moments later. You need to be quiet, or you're going to start looking like Ellsworth. And what makes her laugh? Whoever wrote that for her to say the same thing that Charlotte said, just wild. Lack of charisma in this area stand out all the more is that Tamina has often been paired up with great talkers, such as the time she served as an enforcer to AJ Lee for a while in 2013 and 2014. 
Then after that partnership ran its course, there was the period she spent alongside the likes of Lana, Sasha Banks, and Naomi, mm-hmm. three people who, while they may not be the best to ever do it on the microphone, are still worlds better than anything the daughter of Jimmy Snuka can deliver. But then, her lack of speaking abilities haven't exactly been a death knell for her career, as with her basically serving as the heavy of the WWE's women's division for much of her time there, Tamina has largely been able to get by on being a silent powerhouse. Which it's is just fine. a shame the same thing can't be said for our next entry, though, because with her being only 5'3 in height, there's little opportunity for Dana Brooke <laughs> oh to serve in that role. So this is meant if she ever wanted to succeed in a major way then, she was going to have to learn how to cut a good promo. Yeah. Unfortunately for the former fitness model, however, such a talent has never exactly been in her wheelhouse. (laughs) No, whenever she's been in a segment which has called for her to talk, in fact, it's usually gone down like a lead balloon. And I'm not a household name like you! It doesn't matter if it was her time on NXT or her subsequent spell on the main roster, Brooke just never seemed to pick it up when it came to that part of her craft. And that's a shame because with her not exactly being the best wrestler in the world either, it's pretty much guaranteed she'll never rise above the spot of mid-card player within the halls of New York. Yeah. Sure, she's had her moments over the years, such as the time she joined up with Titus O'Neil and Apollo Crews to create Titus Worldwide, or the period where she became a 15-time holder of the illustrious 24-7 title. But she succeeded in... It's crazy, because she got featured endeavored. She got featured endeavored, man. I'm I'm pretty sure that parts part part and do because of her, you know, promo ability as well. Um, but yeah, they they let her go. So it's just one of those things where it's like it's a give and take type situation or whatnot. But uh yeah. It's unfortunate, man. Hopefully, you know, wherever she ends up going, she's able to hone her craft if she decides to still keep wrestling, hone her craft and and get better. On in all aspects. I'm wishing nothing but the best for her. But yeah, that that sound about right. If you're not really good at talking, not really the best in the ring, they're probably not gonna push you that much. Hell, the people that are really good in the ring and great talkers, sometimes they don't even push them like they should. So what does that say for the people that are not on that level at all? It's like there's a good chance at some point you're gonna get featured endeavored. Those moments in spite of her lack of promo abilities, because others were able to carry the weight for her. And outside of such times, she hasn't really done much of note at all, mostly just milled around in a death spot that is the women's tag team division, alongside a variety of partners such as Manny Rose, Rhea Ripley, and Liv Morgan. But for as bad as she is when it comes to getting people interested and about through her words, even Dana Brooke doesn't hold the distinction of being the worst on the modern day WWE roster. And that's because a certain former UFC bantamweight champion has her beat in this area. She was bad i don't think she's i'm not sure if she's in wwe anymore i believe her contract may have been i believe it may have expired i'm not sure we just she hasn't been on television in a while yeah nah she can legit kick your ass but her promo skills are atrociously cringe and not good That's right, it's time to talk about Ronda Rousey. Now, no one is going to doubt Ronda's skills as a fighter. Hell, there was a period where you could have made a solid argument she was the most dominating MMA performer in the world. Yeah. And while figures such as Amanda Nunes or Valentino Shevchenko have gone on to surpass her in the long run, there's no doubt the baddest woman on the planet was the best at one time. Yeah. That said, part of the reason she was able to become so successful during her time in UFC is that she wasn't really required to cut promos in order to get her fights over. No, while she would have to do the odd pre- and post-match interview, it wasn't like she was being asked to monologue about the backstory between her and her opponent here, Mm -hmm. something she would have to do once she signed on the dotted line with WWE in 2018. And when she did have to start cutting promos inside the squared circle then, her lack of skills in this department suddenly became apparent for all to see, and as such, a little bit of the aura she'd developed over the years dissipated. Of course, that's not to say she didn't find success in the world of pro wrestling. No, quite the opposite, in fact, as during her rookie year there, Rousey showed herself to be something of a prodigy in the ring. Still, though, her first go around, she was she was she was she was holding it down, bro. She had some great matches or whatnot. She was holding it down. It's just her promo ability was not there. But, the you know, 
at the time it was just it's Ron Rousey and WWE. Holy shit, you know, people are really hyped about it or whatnot. But her promo abilities were to be, were to be desired. Then when she came back around the second time, it just it, it seemed like it got worse. And then on top of that, the, the stuff she was saying on Twitter while she was gone and she was kind of, you know, rubbing the fans the wrong way. It was just a, a multitude of things on top of her microphone ability not having improved. It was like, all right, bro. Okay. Oh, whenever that microphone was handed to her and she spoke to the crowd in the most stilted and unnatural sounding of ways, yep. it couldn't help but make things feel a little less special. Mm -hmm. And this was even more noticeable during her second run in 2022 and 2023. Yep, like I just said. As by that point, with her in-ring work also having atrophied, all of her yep. flaws only stuck out that much more. So maybe it's for the best. She seems to have entered at least semi-retirement now with her last bout what they did with her and Shayna in that backstage interview, that's what they should have been doing. More so of that or have someone be a speaker for her. But if you couldn't find that, the backstage interviews, that worked better because that's more in the lane of where the world she came from. More so of interviews and post interviews or media scrums or whatever to, you know, talk about a fight, talk about their opponent or talk about, the, you know, talk about her victory or loss or whatever the case may be. Those interviews, those work better than her actually going out there delivering a promo because it, it just wasn't that good. Against her real life friend Shayna Baszler at August of the latter year's SummerSlam, marking the final date of her current contract. Oh, well, there you go. Will she return again in the future? I doubt this it. remains to be seen. I doubt it. But if another former UFC champion schedule is anything to go by, we wouldn't be surprised if she does come back periodically. After all, there's a lot of money to be made in WWE, even if you're as bad a talker as Brock Lesnar is. Oh, yes, man. we do have to preface this one by saying <laughs> that during his current run in Vince McMahon's promotion, the Beast's Ooh. verbal skills have improved somewhat, at least to the point. I know someone's going to clip this and send this dub. I don't care. Early in his career? No. He could have kept the microphone away from him. Like that, he was not good at talking on the microphone, but he didn't really need to be because he was out here destroying people. Later, recently, like two years ago, when he actually just, when they separated him and Paul and Paul's with Roman, he actually seemed actually normal. Like, it, not normal in the sense of, like, delivering a normal promo. I guess you can say in the sense of it sounded actually decent. It didn't sound bad. It didn't sound forced. It, it sounded like we were just talking to Brock himself. Like, it wasn't no character that he needed to portray. That's why I said it sounded normal. It sounded like how Brock would normally talk to anybody if he chose to talk to somebody. You know what I'm saying? And it actually worked. It actually worked. But in early in his career, no, he was not that good at talking on the microphone. Point he no longer needs, Paul Heyman is a mouthpiece. That said, during his initial run in the early 2000s, this was not the case. No. As back then, even if he looked like the Incredible Hulk and moved like the Flash, all the goodwill such talents created frittered away whenever he was given a live microphone. Yeah. I landed on my noggin. And that's because, landed like with everyone noggin. else we've discussed today, Brock's skills have never been as a talker. No, he's always been more about getting his point across using his fists, or if not them, then several well-placed German suplexes. Yeah. So this is exactly why, back when he was a rookie still working on conquering the wrestling world, he was given a mouthpiece in the form of oh, the hey former man. ECW owner, with that turning out to be the best thing possible for both right. men involved, as it created a partnership <laughs> for the ages. One which can still to this day stand tall amongst the likes of Bobby Heenan and Nick Bockwinkle or Paul Bearer and The Undertaker. Mm -hmm. Sadly though, as the saying goes, all good things must come to an end eventually. And so, despite the pair reuniting for a few years following Lester's return to the ring in 2012, after a period spent dominating the world of MMA, come 2020, Heyman would move on to an all-new client in the tribal chief, Roman Reigns. Yep. Needless to say, then, this left little room left in his date book for dealing with the 11-time world champion, and as a result, Brock was forced to learn how to carry himself in promo situations all of a sudden. Thankfully, though, he's been able to do this to at least a satisfactory degree over yeah. the months since, meaning he technically shouldn't be in this video anymore, if we're being honest. 
But then, given how bad he was initially, maybe his spot is still one which has been earned for a lifetime. <laughs> and he's not the only one who has a lifetime pass onto the Bad Promo Hall of Fame, as our next subject also fills a full-time spot there on account of his routinely terrible mic work. Who are we talking about this time? Who else yep, but the British, British Bulldog? Bulldog. That's right, Davy Boy Smith may have been a spectacular athlete, someone who could perform physical feats most other men his size wouldn't be able to dream of. And he may have had charisma to burn, which is exactly why to this day many British wrestling fans still consider him to be their GOAT. Hell, so over was he during the transition period between the Golden and New Generation eras, he even got to main event 1992's SummerSlam show in front of a sold-out Wembley Stadium with him there pinning his cousin Bret Hart to become the Intercontinental Champion to an absolutely catastrophic home field ovation. Mm -hmm. Sadly though, even at his heights, he just wasn't someone who could carry himself when it came to the other all-important element of his job, and this was getting things across during speaking segments. No, rather than be able to talk fans into watching him wrestle via his gift of the gab, Davy Boy arguably turned people off, if anything, during his promos, as they were so boring, <laughs> so bereft of any kind of charm, you could be forgiven for wondering why Vince McMahon chose to push him at all. And it wasn't as if he got any better at this as his career progressed, either. You want a chance of me? Come on and take a piece of me. Oh, man, that was... Oh, that was tough, bro. You, you want... A chance of me? What was that, man? Ah, that was a tough one. I ain't gonna lie to you. That was hard to watch. It didn't matter if it was his subsequent spell in WCW or his later return to New York during the peak years of the Attitude Era, in fact. One thing about the Manchester native always remained constant, and yeah. this was that he couldn't cut a good promo at all. Oh, man. This was a great one, bro. I enjoyed this video. Man, like I said... There, you you fall into a certain category. You got to figure out which category you fall into, you know. And not everybody's gonna have the gift of gab when it comes to the microphone abilities. If that was the case, then everyone would be able to do promos, and it wouldn't be as special. I'm not saying that we want to see people messing up promos, but at the same time, I feel like it's an acquired skill that deserves time and dedication to be able to pull off. I want y'all to understand, it is not easy to give a promo and sell yourself in front of thousands of people live, in front of millions watching around the country or around the world. It's not easy. So kudos to anyone that can actually go out there and give it their best shot. It may not land, it may not work all the time, but I got to give respect to anyone that's willing to go out there on a microphone and try to sell themselves and sell a match and sell a feud it's not easy at all so comment down below let me know who do you feel like is the worst promo of all time in wrestling like whenever they pick up a microphone you damn near want to change the television let me know who you feel like is the worst promo out there worst microphone user out there man but i appreciate all love support you guys shown on the channel Bro to 150k and i'm still young speed of youtube wrestling champion world appreciate y'all keeping me see you next week